All right, The Challengers, it is episode 24 of the Late Challenge podcast. And if you want to head over to our Patreon and sign up for as little as £1 per week, there are now 11 subscriber shows on there for you to get your teeth into as well. On the show today, we're going to talk about some light stuff to begin, namely pies and crisps, before getting stuck into a much heavier and more serious topic, mental health. Uh, I'll also, as ever, have a fact of the week for you. Um, if you're watching on video, you will notice that I am wearing glasses. Um, another sign that I'm an old fucker, mate. I, I went for my eyes tested. Uh, I've, I've always needed them for distance since like mid-20s. Mm. So like the match drive and that kind of thing. But I've felt for a while that like looking at screens and things like that, it's just a bit, ooh. And uh, the woman tested them and all that and said, um, yeah, you need readers. So these are me readers. I've got readers, so you, if you're listening, you might want to go and jump over onto the YouTube and and check it out. Do you know what's that? Do you know what's that funny though? Like for everyone listening and watching, you literally pulled them out 30 seconds before we started recording, yeah. and I had no idea. So it, in the one on the one hand, it's a sign of like how old we're getting, but on the other hand, the little kid inside me is just like, oh my god, Roman's got glasses. Yeah, he's got oh glasses my god, on. he's got glasses on. Oh my god, he's got gl- what? The, like well, it's always had literally like that little thing though. inside me that's going like, can I have a go on them? <laughs> and you're like, the good we're just children. Like what she said, in sp- like specifically, she said like you'll really notice the difference if you use like computers a lot and all that, and I do. Like straight away, I do. Like you know, looking at this now, I'm like. I was looking at this before, you know what I mean? Like if I move that now, I'm like, oh, that's grim. This is well better. I'm that's into mad, it. isn't it? Um, so I think I might be doing that, but I'm doing the, t- I'm doing pe- the typical dad thing. Yeah, loads of, of people my it. age, like my mate, I was out with my mates at the weekend, even, you know, like Debbie as well as another one who, who um, is avoiding it. They're all the same. They're all like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm struggling a bit. You know, like if it's like ingredients on a jar or something, I'm like, whoa. I found myself doing that last week. You were like, and I remember my dad doing this. Like, do you hold it a little it bit further awesome. away from yourself? Yeah, all like, that. I found myself just twisting it. We all do the same thing because it's been programmed into us. No reason for this. Why does turning it to I the know. side help a I little know. bit? It's mad, isn't it? Um, so, okay, um, on this week's, oh, sorry, on last week's fact of the week, I just wanted to mention, obviously we talked about, for those that watched and listened, we talked about Old Mother Redcap and a pub for pirates and pillagers on the Whittle. Um, we had a number of people get in such to point out that there are Old Mother Redcap boozers in Blackburn. Uh, there was one in Dublin as well, which was much loved, but I believe it's gone now. Uh, a bit of Googling as well suggested that there were also Old Mother Redcap boozers in Sheffield, Accrington, Luton and Camden um, so I'm sure there's more as well uh, I, I kind of got a bit confused and I was like well what has she just been getting around a lot like or or like is this a, a thing uh, when I've dug into it a little bit it appears that that gear that outfit if you like was associated with witches and genuine you know gen- generally like evil women type thing and all that kind of stuff so I think rather than it being one woman from the world who was helping pirates I think it's like lots of you know, people who were regarded as evil once upon a time and then it's gone into, like, you know, a uh, local history and ended up being a pub and all that so kind of thing. So they had, like, a little, like, uniform? If you Apparently were, if so, you were yeah, that woman yeah. in your town, that's how you... Yeah, like, I wear, wearing, you know, some kind of red cap stroke shawl was a thing. Um, I like that. So uh-huh, if you yeah. just rock up at a town and you're wondering who's going to help you get rid of your stolen goods, you're just looking for the woman yeah, with the red cap on. old mother red cap. Um also as well, uh, regarding the actual, um, my question about it all wasn't, if you remember, was that I said, you know, I, I don't get why a woman who was associated with all that has now got a statue on the Whittle either. Mm. Um, we heard from Andy Stocker, uh, whose uncle Robbie was actually the artist commissioned to make said statue. Uh, so he's promised to quiz his uncle and report back. So more as we have it on that. Um Okay, uh, we're straight into, um, I did promise you pies, I did promise you Chris. We're going to talk a little bit about that now. So pies, uh, we're, we're bringing back the crunching challenge in a way. Uh, we're just going to talk though, we're not going to taste anything today. Uh, so pies on Sunday, 
Uh, I posted it up on Twitter. Uh, we are on all social media channels, by the way, so get following. I posted it up uh, if there was anything that people wanted to hear this pair of gobshites discuss. Uh, and among the replies was one from the best bakery in Liverpool, bar none, Home Baked. Uh, if you don't know what Home Baked is, uh, the context is that it's a bakery in the shadow of Liverpool's ground on Oakfield Road in Anfield. Uh, very much community-based part of the community. They've, they've set it up as a community-based organisation, giving people jobs, training them up. It's fantastic. But also the pies are absolutely brilliant as well. Uh, so they already do sort of like footy related pies. They've got a Shankly pie, uh, which is my my favourite, uh, which is steak, mushrooms, bacon, leeks and celery. It's absolutely quality. Uh, there's a clop pie, which includes premium German beer, I'm guessing Erdinger, uh, peppered steak, onion, gherkin, capers and potatoes. Sounds uh, horrible, that. They've also been known to do a cloppage roll, uh, which features German bratwurst, honey, and mustard. Um, but they they tweeted me regarding you know what we could talk about this week. They said which current or former LFC player deserves a pie named after them from us, and what would you put in it? Uh, they, they, they did put a little star saying pending chef's approval, which I think is fair enough. Um, so I had to think about this. I mean, you know. I thought, well, if they branch out, they could do Patrick Burgers uh, and they could have a bit of Dajun mustard. <laughs> you love Joe, something I've noticed while we've been doing this. You love like little word plays and stuff. Oh, don't yeah, you? absolutely. The one, the one that I remember when you were, you were made up because you were beating Chat GPT at coming up with hotels for Oasis. Yeah, and yeah, cafes yeah. And, and stuff. cafes roll, roll with, with it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do love all that. I think that, that that's a nod back to the, uh, you know, the sub-editor newspaper days and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that they were awful puns from me there. Uh, but I thought on a more serious note, a Jersey Dudek pie could be good. Mm. I was thinking you could call it the Big Pole. And obviously he's legendary enough for his contribution to Istanbul. Uh, that save that we all don't know how he made to this day and all the rest of it. And obviously in the penalty shootout as well. So I thought, okay, so if you had the big pole, what would be in the big pole pie? And I looked up like um, Polish delicacies and there's something called bigos, uh, which is a Polish hunter's stew. Uh, it says it's a hearty, long-simmered meat and sauerkraut stew made of any combination of pork, beef, game, poultry, and vegetables. Single pot dish is usually made during long winter days or for special occasions. Now, I think that sounds boss. Mm -hmm. I think that would work in a pie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm throwing that back at your uh, home-baked bakery. Uh, see what you think. Um, we got loads of suggestions on this, which was really good because I, I love it when Twitter gets going in a positive way and you start getting um, nice feedback and, and people getting in on it. Uh, I did quite like that. The Grim Sleeper said, what about an El Hadji pie? Now, I don't know why you would want an El Hadji pie, but someone else replied and said, would you want spit in your pie, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, obviously a foul a pie and it could be sil filled with salt and pepper chicken that was from Count Cube uh, David uh, Frantic Dave he said um, it could have crisps in it and be called the Steve Nickel because Nickel famously ate lots and lots of bags of crisps uh, Tom Kem said a Torben Pige Pige doesn't work does it because he's saying when, right when, when, when you write it down it, it says pie Tom it, picnic, picnic has pie at the start. So nice try, Tom, uh, but I'm not having it. I think this is an absolute winner from Claire Whitehurst. So I saw this and I just thought that's a belter. So, you know, the new lad, Sabozlai, um, she's saying the Saboz pie. And obviously he's from Hungary and their national dish is goulash, which is quality. I've been to Hungary. I've ate the goulash in Hungary. It was amazing. And I think that would be boss in a pie. And the Saboz pie is a great name as You're well. You're saying that's the win. The Saboz pie works, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I, so I think that's an absolute belter from Claire. And um, it's a good way to it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to remember how to say his name now because of the pie. There you go. The so Saboz pie. Win win all round. Um, we had some other suggestions as well. Um, the Robbo, uh, not me, uh, the Robertson. Uh, it could have haggis, neeps, and tatties. Uh, someone else replies to that and saying, well, that could be a Kenny, couldn't it, as well? Um, we had a steak and ale. It's another this one only works another in writing. That didn't work, uh, <laughs> because it, they put in brackets, X McAllister. So it's steak and ale, steak and Alexis McAllister. 
Nice, nice try, crafty Sam, but I'm not having it. Um, I like this as well. Like someone, should, something with mascarano. Be like, you could have pie and mascarano, couldn't you? Or something like that as like a meal. Pie maybe. and mascarano. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, Mingle, uh, Michael has uh, come out with some belters here. I love that he uh, added a gif of I'll get my coat to eat. He's gone with the Torben pie chnick again. We're still not having it. He's, he's um, suggested a flan moldy. Uh, which I like. Uh, a it's right up your street, that. He's, he's, in, he's right in your ballpark yeah, with that. Yeah, super, me. mate. I'm, I'm into these. A Barry Venison Pie. Um, an Alison Baker. <laughs> I didn't get that one, to be honest. My mission's not in there. Yeah. Just, what? Alison Baker. Yeah, it's just because the baker. Baker, baker. Baker, baker, yeah. That shit. He, he does says, say it, after it's still shit, he, 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 he says still shit, but I'm not going to stop. And then a, a dough salad. <laughs> And he put, I'm losing yet, I can feel it. Do Salah. And his last one is a Phil Bap. I mean, yeah. Shite. And then, of course, he ended with the gif of I'll get me coat, yeah. uh, which I, I enjoyed. Um, people, a few people suggesting crisps pies, which could be named Nabi Kaita because he appeared to be made of them. Uh, Simla was suggested for Joel Matip as well. Um, someone suggested a Peter Crouch one with extra virgin olive oil in it. Um, uh, there was a fuck the Tories uh, suggested um, a John Barnes jerk chicken pie, which could be nice. Don Brown suggested a Milner, which would be lean beef, plain potato in a rye bean a gravy. I like that one. Yeah, uh, that's good. I isn't think it? that was my favourite. Uh, it's, it's right on, right on brand. Have isn't you got it? any yourself? Did you no, think about I haven't it? had much time to think of it, but uh, the, the one that popped into my head was just a random one. Was was it was it Ron Yates that um, Shankly did the just walk around and thing? Just have a massive, yeah. a massive pie, a Huge dead tall, pie. a dead tall one though. Pies are always dead low, aren't they? Just have a dead tall one, just with just steak call it in Ron it. Yates. Ron Yates, and just put and put and just walk, put, around, just walk, it. Ra- walk, walk around, around it. it. Yeah, I'm into it. Well, let, let us know if you've got any more suggestions. Uh, we, we'll we're happy to just carry that on forever. I think and uh, talk about puns about pies. Uh, the other thing was. Um, I think her name was Kate Bradders. I've just gone off the uh, agenda to get into the actual article. But she sent us an article um, from The Mail. Um, stay with me. I know. Um, so, but this is interesting. This is about crisps. And, and it goes back to when we were talking about crisps every week and we talked about food. We talked about how things were getting a lot, well smaller, didn't we? And, and about mm. like, you know, some of the multi-packs of crisps were absolutely shit in terms of like, like you'd open the pack and you got about six crisps. Mm. So I think it comes from that, that a, a Mail reporter, a Daily Mail reporter, decided to do something on how much air are in your packets of crisps, which, you know, piqued me interest. Um, so they did this test, um, and they went into great detail in the article about how they did the test. I, I don't think we're asked, are we? We'll just take the results. Um, so they said in Monster Munch, there's 26% air in the bag. Doritos, 33. Hula Hoops, 20. Walker's Cheese and Onion, 37% of the bag is just air. And uh, what's it? It's 24%. Um, so, yeah, the, some some revelations there. And obviously, like, you know, for balance, they had to go and ask the actual um, manufacturers about it all. And uh, some of the claims left me stroking my chin about why it is, I've got to be honest with you. Um, so they, they claim that it's sort of, sort of like, so PepsiCo.co, uh, PepsiCo UK, the maker of four of the five Chris tested, they said uh, it fills its packets by weight rather than volume, uses state-of-the-art technology, blah, 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 blah. It's to keep the Chris fresh and crunchy. Uh, we blast a small amount of air into the pack just before we seal it. It also cushions and protects the crisps in the packet. Um, now, they're not going to say, we're bulking it up with air so you think you're getting something that you're not. Because who's going to say that? But it, it kind of feels like it's part of the general... You know, when we were talking for a few weeks about we feel like we're getting blagged by society a bit, this this feels for, part of that general blag. Yeah. We, we don't need 37% air in our crisps. Yeah, but, I, but even as you were saying it, like I've thought this for ages, like stats and stuff, you, you always need a comparison, you need a bar. So like where, where would be the bag of crisps? Because you've got to be some air in a bag of crisps. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So like where... Like, it'd be interesting to see a bag of crisps full, but still does what they say they want it to do. 
Do you know what I mean? So it's got enough air in but it like, to keep so, them you know, fresh. What, what did we, some of them ones we opened when we were doing it, like there was like eight crisps yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff, wasn't there? Well, especially things like, I remember people like messaging in about like the wheat crunchies and stuff like that. You yeah. could literally count They're out eight crisps. Yeah. It, like the, the amount of them in a multi-pack version yeah. is absolutely shit. It's a disgrace. Yeah. Um, also on this this same article, they sort of, you know, the mail, um, whatever you think of it, it's shit and full of Tories. Um, in terms of their online stuff, like they absolutely smash it. It's the most, it's the, I believe it's the most popular newspaper site. And one of the reasons is they are quite good at the way it's laid out of getting you into reading other stuff on there. Like, um, and I've I, just seen a story like flicking down the side. Like it is just pure. Whenever we're looking for agenda stuff, we could just go to you could mail, just do the mail. Just I know. Well, I did suggest it, and, I, I mean, and we still we still never done it, but maybe we should do it one week. I suggested we've always even started the podcast. Perhaps one week I could buy a certain paper, or we you could buy a different one, or we can then we could come and meet in the middle and say, okay, what mad stories have you got, and what do you think of a paper, and we could just get stuck into them. So maybe we do that one week. But this this is Matt, I think, just on eating it again. So chocolate biscuits, which we briefly touched on, and then we decided to not to, to go with it. They've done one of these researches from Oxford University, blah, blah, blah. So apparently there were people always that were, in my eyes, eating their chocolate biscuits the wrong way around. I've never heard, like for me, the chocolate's on the top of the biscuit and, and you eat you dunk it and you eat it and the chocolate's on the top as it goes into your mouth. Apparently though, loads of people were doing it the other way around. And, and it took researchers to apparently settle the debate. And they say the best <laughs> way... Do you know the shit like this? People are spending their time doing, like, researchers. Do you when you, you'll see, like, studies coming out? I remember the one stuck in What's my head. Go, researchers going, like, my, mice can't walk upstairs backwards. Like, they've spent 10 years figuring it out. And you're like... What? Sorry, couldn't you have been doing something better with your time than this? Why did any researchers need to dedicate some of their time to this? Well, this is Oxford as well. You know what I mean? It's like the you know the, the bastion of <laughs> education in doing? this country, and they're saying uh, you, they they claim you should pick the biscuits up with the chocolate side up, but then flip them over before they go into your mouth. Why, Why? the fuck would you do that? Why? It's just, I don't get it. I, I don't get why I don't get why it's research and I don't get why people are eating chocolate digesters upside down. This is a much down. bigger topic than this though. Like, I'm just picturing everyone at Oxford. Like, I think there must be, there'll be fucking researchers at Oxford trying to like, you know, cure fucking cancer, elongate yeah. human life. And then it's like, Joe, they're in the fucking student union. What, what are you up to this week, lad? Oh, we're just stu- uh, researching whether you should eat chocolate biscuits with the chocolate up or down. Well, um, the, mad. if you're wondering, like, literally what, what the science allegedly is around it, they say that the, the method that, that I just described it allows the brain to register the chocolate coating while flipping them before eating, maximizes the oral, oral somatocentry experience of the chocolate melting on the tongue. So yeah, that's what, why it's that way, that's why it's that way around according to them. Yeah, but so you're putting the chocolate it, directly onto your tongue. Yeah, but that makes sense to eat it that way. But why pick it up the other way? No, yeah, well I know. Makes no fucking sense. But it? also, it all ends up in your mouth eventually anyway. And you take like I've had it the other. I've I've picked it up with the chocolate on the top and ate it that way all my life, and it still tasted sound. Yeah, do you know what's funny though? That, like, <laughs> that, this is mad. That's, I'm with you all the way. So I would always eat a chocolate digestive that way round. But it was funny when we started the chocolate cr- biscuit, the biscuits crunching challenge. Yeah. One of the ones I was going to bring in and a few people suggested that. I thought, oh, that's interesting that. Have you seen the Fox's cookies that are coated on one side with chocolate? Yeah. They're the, for me, they're the greatest fucking chocolate biscuits in the world because it's a, like, it's a fucking chocolate cookie. Fox's co- the chocolate The big them, aren't they? It's they're like, massive. Yeah. They've got loads of chocolate chunks in them. They never skimp on that. And they've got a layer of chocolate. But when I eat them, I eat them with the chocolate on the bottom. But I've realised how how mad is that I've thought about this. It's because I want to see where the chocolate chunks are when I'm eating it. Whereas when you're eating a chocolate digestive, it's all just the same, isn't it? Why do you want to see where the chunks are? Because I like to, I have this thing. I've had this since I was a little kid. I always eat the worst bits first. So like, if you watch me eat a meal, like me one with the, so Joe, you know, and it, I reckon it comes from like trauma, mild. Me, Joe, you know, me one goes, there's your Sunday dinner. You've got to eat your sprouts. So in my head as a kid, I'd be like, right, well, I'll fucking eat them first then and get them out the way. So I'd, so I'd go, then my brain took that to the next level and was like, right, I want to finish eating 
my favourite bits. So I'll eat all the shit bits first. So that has extended to even eating a cookie. I'll be looking at it thinking, I want my last bite to be full of chocolate chunks. So I think, I'll I think eat. you need to work this through with someone, you know. Um, I think, I think, I think you need to sit down and discuss <laughs> this, that with someone. Does this, does this tie into the second half of the show? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. My serious mental health. Yeah, uh, we are going to talk about mental health. Uh, you know, jumping in on the Dali Ali stuff, but um, I just want to, I just want to throw this in though, like on the, like the the mail and how mad it is. We've said before, and I've I've seen a couple of people tweet us about mentioning this, and whenever I see it now, John, we mentioned weeks ago about. That, that that clickbait headline, you'll never guess what such a body from yeah. a movie 30 years ago looks like now. And you're like, I probably would, they'd be 30 years older. There's one here. Did you see Brad Pitt was at the Wimbledon final? And there's a, oh, and there's like, a little headline here. The two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's older. Oh, but it says here, and this, there's even like a, there's a picture of him and then an insert of him eating crisps. Brad Pitt, 59, wows viewers with his very, in capitals, ageless, ageless good looks at Wimbledon and leaves fans tickled by looking stunning while enjoying crisps caught. And there's a little insert of him eating oh, a crisp. Oh. And it's like, that's think about what that story is. Brad Pitt looks good for his age and he still eats crisps. Yeah. And you're like, wow. Is that what you got I mean, into journalism for? I know. I, I mean, you know, I haven't worked at a tabloid, I know how it works, basically like, you know, all the pictures come in from the celebrity photographers and you're just sitting there going, what, well, sh- what shit can we write about that? But the I, reality I, is that'll be one of the most read stories oh, today, yeah, well, won't it? well, people will want to look at Brad Pitt, won't they? Do yeah. you know what I mean? Which is, you know, fair enough, like. Yeah. Good looking fella. Yeah, I like looking man. Um, <laughs> uh, let's do the fact <laughs> before we get into the uh, the heavier side of the show. So uh, this week I am telling you about the Beatles statue at the Pierhead in Liverpool. Each member of the band's sculpture has a secret symbol on it. Did Ooh, you know this? Oh, no. Does uh, this tie into... No, this... Go on, you do it first and then we'll talk. So about John, uh, in John's hand there are two acorns. Uh, that relates to the fact that in June 68, John and Yoko planted two acorns in the Garden of Coventry Cathedral to represent their wish for world peace. After they married in 69, they also sent pairs of acorns to leaders across the world, encouraging them to plant them again around the idea of peace. Uh, so that's why he's got two acorns in his hand, the statue of him at the Pierhead. Uh, the statue of Paul, or the sculpture of Paul, is carrying a video camera. Uh, which relates to Linda, who, of course, was a photographer. Uh, Ringo, meanwhile, has an eight cut into his shoe, which is a reference to his birthplace, Madrin Street in Dingle, Liverpool 8, the postcode. Uh, And George has Sanskrit words on his belt from the Hindu Gayatra Mantra. Hopefully I've said that right. Uh, which translates as "Om the divine light, please guide our minds to the divine so we can experience it within and around us to live the divine life. George became a devout Hindu after the Beatles spent some time with Indian guru Mara, Mararishi Mahesh Yogi in 1967. <laughs> Thought those fucking glasses were meant to make it better. That was my pronunciation. Fuck all to do with my glasses. Maharishi Mahesh. Um... Ma- Maharishi Mah- Mahesh Maharishi, Yogi. Yeah. Maharishi. Well, that's what, um, I, what did I say? Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's the fact. It's good that. I thought I was. What I was going to jump in and ask you was, get, what did you see? <laughs> ties into our. Uh, we'll we'll do more of this in the future. Teasing for probably on the Patreon show when we talk about conspiracy theories the other week. Have you ever have you seen any of the stuff about like the Illuminati and all that and like the secret symbols all the famous people give to each other because they're in the secret club. And there's one, oh, it was our mate Matt sent me it the other week. Like, oh, there's, but it, honestly, it's, some of them are mad because you, you are a bit like, so sorry, what's the other explanation though? When they go, like, I'm, and Matt sent me saying, fuck it out, but like laughing faces, McCartney's in it as well. Because he goes on like, do you know the Jonathan Ross show or something and does a mad thing with his hands, like a little symbol as he goes on. And like, fucking hell, Paul, but it might not even be Paul, might it, after us chatting the other week? Well, that's it. But I mean, and it just sounds like the same thing about the Paul being dead thing that we talked about on, on the Patreon. You know, it just sounds like, you know, you've come up with an idea and then you just look for any example well, where I, someone's been snapping the hands in a certain mate, position. This, this it's like, is, honestly, and, and this is the thing, because I love, as I've said previously and on that show, I love all that shit. I, I just think it's dead entertaining. And at the same time, like I'm open minded to it, and I can I feel like I can look at it with a bit of a Joe, a critical and cynical view. I watched the video on it last year, and this fellow was like, "See proof of it." And one of the signs he was using as proof of like Joe, dev, devil worshiping is the OK sign. 
Like that's a sign of devil worship. And he just showed like hundreds of wow. photos of celebrities doing the okay sign over their eye and stuff. And you can imagine people going, see? And you're like, they're doing the fucking okay sign. Yeah, it's like a worldwide <laughs> symbol for, for okay. okay. And it means, it, oh, fuck and, off. and as well, all it like, because he was saying that proves that person's a fucking devil worshiper. And I was like, well, don't, I'm not ruling it out. Maybe they are. But also, couldn't it just be that the cameraman said to him in the middle of a three hour shoot, just do the okay sign for a second? As well as doing Joe a hundred other well, some, different poses. Yeah, someone could have said you want fucking sugar in your tea in the yeah. background. He's gone, oh, yeah. okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Fucking, fucking devil, devil. worshiper. Oh, my ass. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was it? I mean, I was going to put on here, and then I talked myself out of it. I was going to put. I was going to say. I was going to put like you know Matt Letizia and uh, Ricky Lambert and all the shite they've been coming out with over the weekend. But then I just thought, nah, I can't be bothered. Do you know what I mean? They're clearly cranks and I'm just not getting involved in it. I don't want to discuss I'll it. I'll have you converted by the end Fuck of this year. Fuck that. I would draw my consent. All right, Matt, yeah. And like, you know, Ricky sound, he just looks like he's had too many 40s there. <laughs> Who's this? Ricky Lambert? Ricky Lambert. Why is he in on it as well? He's in on it as well, but he also, there's another video of him saying like, if, you, if you're like, if you're positive towards a glass of water, you know, it'll do X, Y, and Z. And if you're negative, and you're just like, oh. It's true. Oh, oh no. this is a whole different topic. We're going to... We're not doing it's it. It's true. Is Have it? you never seen that? No, I'm There's not a asked. study. There's a study. It's just, it's just bollocks. But, but it's funny because you don't also... make a video of yourself saying that and put it on Twitter and expect people to take you seriously, do you? And like, you know, it got <laughs> it got watched because people buzzed off it and shared it on the WhatsApp groups and said, look at these weirdos. And then you've got like, People that then quote tweeting the thing saying, look, see, everyone's on it. Look at the numbers that's done. Yeah, it's not people agreeing with it. It's not people saying I would draw my consent to be, you know, ruled by this government as well. It's people looking at them going, cranks. I only saw a little bit of that. We haven't probably haven't got time for it. What was it? What was it about? You just, you don't consent to being governed by the government? But essentially, yeah. And what? Exactly. No one's asked. <laughs> who, who, who asked you? No, but, but not like, even that. Oh, Ricky Lambert's not, not someone, withdraws his consent. Oh, right, so well, but, fuck me. So, but someone mentioned, like, me, me and Let, links to David Icke the other week. Then. Like, I've watched some David Icke stuff and, and it, it's again one of those from, mad stuff, but, but there's a bit in his, me and Matt have talked about this, like, David Icke's got this big thing of like, it's a similar thing. Don't do what the government says. And you're like, all right, let's say I even go with you in theory, right? So all today, and this does tie into other people, a bit like the Russell Brand stuff, revolution and all that. You're like, okay, let's just go with it for a second. Let's just say today, we all just say, no. What are we doing tomorrow? Like, who's running the place? But what are you saying no someone, to? But someone's got to fucking run it, haven't they? Like when I, I mean, get up in the shit. morning and make me breakfast and get ready, like, what am I saying no to? Yeah. You know what I mean? The government's not in me house. You know, like in you know the the day to day. Oh, though. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, well, well, I mean, me, I was quite positive towards me porridge this morning, and it tasted really <laughs> nice. Um, but you know what I mean? It, 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 I just think fuck off. Like you can convince me or something if you've got like a solid argument and and you've got facts and you've got stuff that you know. And I'll go all right, yeah. Maybe we do need like another political party. Maybe you know, like the, the Tories and Labour are too closely al aligned at the minute and things like that. So I'm open to all that. I'll listen mm -hmm. to you if you want to talk about that. But if you come on Twitter and start going about a glass of water or just randomly coming on and saying I would draw my consent. <laughs> like, so what? No, no, about that's, what? That's my big thing about this. But I, and I've seen this over the years in all aspects of my life, right? Especially being a lawyer. And people love like talking about the problem, right? So it's like withdraw your consent. It's like, yeah, okay. But what's the fucking solution then? Yeah. Like if what all right, now, then? I'm like you, I'm willing to what's Ricky doing I think now? all political parties pretty much are just fucking shite. Okay, but the solution isn't just to fucking pack Jibbe. it in, is it? No, the no, the yeah. solution is to go, well, all right, create a better one then. Yeah. If you were if you run a campaign saying, I'm starting a new political party and this is what it's going to stand and for, get behind have. that. Yeah, and like, and sound. plenty of people have, haven't they? There's plenty of independent political parties that people have, have tried to start or even do so locally. And, you know, there are they're independent can candidates who've been elected locally in Liverpool and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and good on them, sound. And, and if they're doing something different to the other parties, yeah, or, or more power to their elbow. But I just don't get what, what you're achieving there. You know, like Matt, Matt, Matt Letizia and the other fella, they're just, they're just going further and further down this rabbit hole where people think they're weirdos. And they must know that. You're not convincing anyone. So what what is it you're up to? Well, have you ever seen, I, I often think this, have you ever seen the clip going back to like, Joe, that, 
the head of all it, like one of the biggest ones, David Icke. Have you ever seen the clip that like started him off just as a laughing stock? He was on Wogan and Wogan basically went to him. But like the crowd, and it was, I think it was a bit cruel actually, Joe, when you think it was on live TV and stuff and like the crowd was laughing and Wogan went to him one point, they're laughing at you, you know, they're not laughing with you. Mm. And, but he said to him about like, you know, you, you come across like you think you're Jesus Christ. And he didn't say, I don't think that. And you're like, well, that's where you've gone wrong, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You yeah. can't go on telly saying you think you're Jesus and expect people to be like, oh, sound. Even if you are fucking Jesus, Joe, if, if Jesus came back as the second coming, which he's meant to. I used to love this, Joe, like when you'd learn about it in school, because I went to a Catholic school, and they were like, and one day he'll come back. And even as a kid, I was thinking, well, that won't work out very well, will it? If someone just turns up now and think about the story of Jesus, it's fucking mental. He was just a fella until he was in his mid thirties. And then he started going to people, I'm here Jesus, by the way. And you're like, what? Imagine that now. I just start going to you. Uh, I know I haven't mentioned this to you before, lad, but I think I'm the son of God. You'd be like, fucking hell, like you've said some mad stuff <laughs> ah, on this yeah, show. Yeah. But, yeah. Hey, but maybe that's the next step from, you know, Matt and Ricky. Uh, I mean, like I say, we did. Matt Letizia is going to turn out to be the son of God. Hey, maybe that's the next step from them, who knows? But this is the point. Like, but, but I think no with some of these... It, even the most religious people in the world wouldn't go. Oh, Sandra. I know, I prove it. <laughs> but that's what happened to Jesus the first time around, isn't it? It's like the whole story is just like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how we've ended up to oh, about this. Week. I mean, I, I, I was oh, just going to go off Jesus. on a slight tangent, but you, you mentioned Russell Brand, and like you know, I know some people think he's an absolute crank and all the rest of it. But I, I, like, I, him. I, I like him. I like some of his stuff. Others, he loses me. Like, but you know, I, I listened to a podcast with him, and it was a long one. And um, a lot of you know, he did all his usual stuff where like you're getting out the dictionary to fucking find out what he's going on about sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and he loves that, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? Of course, he does. But. It came by, you know, by the end of that, but when I got to the end of it and when I listened to what, everything he had to say on that particular podcast, I just thought, the crux of what he's saying is we should all just be sound. I always just think this. Yeah. You know, like, you, you know, it's a great de detail about politics and, and all this type of stuff and left and right and it, he's doing this and Brand saying that and blah, blah. And loads of, loads of the middle ground is, can we just be sound with each other? Yeah. So maybe we should just start a be sound party. Mates, I've thought about this for ages. Because <laughs> what's your policy? Be if sound. If you just sit people down and go, forget what you're arguing about. Right, start with what we what we agree mm. on on this topic. Like, you know, like you know, like when you read the headlines though, and you're like, this minister said that um, you know, like refugee children coming into the country, the rooms they're processed in, he wants oh, fucking Mickey Mouse painting over and all this, that off, and yeah. you're like. What the fuck? Yeah. Like, it's a human being. Yeah. And look, you might want to do something about the number of refugees coming into the country. Okay. You know, but the idea that you just don't deal with them as though they're humans and dehumanise them and say, oh no, well, fuck that. Don't have Mickey Mouse on the wall. That might, might, might make someone happy, a kid happy. Like, you grim twat. Yeah. How can you fucking sit there and say that? But, and, but, you the, know, but the point is, and this is the thing I always come back to these days is, that is not the whoever's made that decision is not representative of eighty percent of the population. Are Surely they? Not. If you no, sat down you with eighty percent so. of the population one on one and said to them, "Whatever your political stance is on this, right, and whether you think we should be helping more refugees or less refugees, do you think it's all right to just have a picture of Mickey Mouse on the fucking wall for kids? Mm -hmm. For kids, like the kid. Do, it's like no willing. Will think about the argument. We're encouraging more refugees by having a picture of Mickey Mouse on the wall when they get here." That fucking four-year-old isn't getting on fucking his phone yeah. and going to his mates back in Syria. But have you have you, you ever, need to get over here. They've got pick, pictures but have of you Mickey ever Mouse. Been in a waiting room with the young kids, because you know, because I have, yeah. I, and I have recently. You know, I've got, I've got a, I've got a two and a half year old. Mate, I've had, I've had, I've had a weekend with a three and a five year old, yeah. and we're like talking. What I said before we started recording, you know, like, I waited. need to sort out my energy yeah, because I've, I've I need more energy to deal with a three and a five year old. I've yeah, hundred percent. And like you know, I, I, I've waited in a hospital waiting room with them. And, and guess what? All the walls are painted and guess what? There's pictures everywhere. And so he wrote, he's walking around going dinosaur, elephant, you know, and naming all the animals. And, and, and guess what? That's easier to Great. manage than if he was bored as fuck. Yeah. And like, it's just basic, like, be sound stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, on the subject of being sound, um, Everton FC have certainly a team's being sound towards uh, Delhi Ali. And this is our 
media challenge for the second half of the show. We're talking about all the stuff that came out uh, with him. Uh, he's obviously talked very honestly about uh, his childhood, about his mental health, about an addiction to uh, sleeping pills uh, and everything else that's come around that is his family, um, you know, the fact how he was treated by certain people, that he was abused, you know, a, a big, big story um, and a very brave decision to come out and say what he said. Uh, he's been into rehab with Everton support. Um, he's come out and done this interview with Gary Neville on, on the overlap, which I'm sure you've either seen or you've certainly heard of the headlines around it. Um, he said himself that he didn't want it to come out at this moment in time. Uh, we talked repeatedly about the media. We've just been talking about the media again just now. Um, it, it appears that tabloids had old of the information that he'd been in rehab and were prepared to use it. And he's preempted it and sort of got out there and told the story first, if you like. So good on him. But, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it was exactly the time that he wanted to tell it, which is a little bit grim in itself, but mm. it's, you know, almost a separate topic. But, you know, this this real sort of human story around them. I was thinking about how I've felt myself about him. Do you know what I mean? And like, I don't want to come on here and say I'm some kind of like, you know, I, I can't be influenced by the media or or whatever. And I can remember giving him pelters in the past, to be honest with you. You know, like I remember when he signed for Everton, didn't he turn up in like a Rolls Royce or something like that? And, and I was just thinking, mate, like you've flopped. You, you know, you're a flop. This is another chance. And day one, you turn up like that with that drive and that. And then, you know, there's the there was pictures not long ago of him like sort of, you know, doing balloons and there's like tequila on the table and all this kind of... And again, you know, my immediate reaction at the time, I've got to be honest, was, you know, what are you doing? You know, you've got this obvious talent. Like, you know, there was time, time was where every top club wanted Deli Ali. And I remember like Liverpool fans all kicking off about, you know, because apparently we've seen him at Milton Keynes, but we didn't move for him. Man United fans were saying the same thing. Ferguson, I think, came out and said, you know, we should have moved for, you know, Madrid were supposedly interested mm -hmm. at one point. Full it. And they scored some amazing goals, you know, at his peak. Yeah. Some boss. player. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's got this sort of, well, what, what is it? Second, third chance, whatever you want to call it, or Everton. Um, but yeah, it's it's human, isn't it? What he's done, what he's what he said. And I, I just sort of think, you know, does it again underline that perhaps the media, football fans, us, everyone, we, we talk, I think, too much about like money, wages, trappings of success of being a footballer. And we don't talk enough about the pressure, the way on your mental health, the fame, the spotlight, the bad signs of, of, of all of that, which clearly does eat up quite a lot of them at the top. And probably we don't know the half of it. Do you know what I mean? 100%. And it's it's funny can you, when you put this in and when I saw it last week and it's like my two worlds colliding, isn't it? Especially talking about it on this show. So it's... um. There's, I mean, there's loads of this and it ties back into what we've just been talking about actually, which is worth mentioning. I, I saw a clip with Tom Holland, the actor, Spider-Man. Um, he's done a, he's been done a podcast interview and he was talking about something similar. Like he, he just made some, like a very, um, no, nowhere near this level of what Deli Ali's done, but just made some public statement that he was going to come off. He realised he he developed an unhealthy addiction around social media mm -hmm. and it was damaging him, his mental health. So he made the decision to come off it. And, he, and even the way he taught, he said it on the podcast, he was like, so I had to make a public announcement about it because that's just the way it is. Like, and it's like, yeah, he's a fucking Hollywood superstar. His PR team's going to be going to him. Well, you can't just go can't quiet. Just disappear, yeah. You're going to have to say something. And he said the, the way the press ran with that was just fucking out of order. Like it may, painted him as this like, you know, He's, he's fucked, he's off the rails. This the, the 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 angle was, so this smiley, happy lad who you think is sound is not, he's fucked. And it's like- Mental health that's, crisis. That's not helping anyone. All that kind of stuff. It's that not helping be, anyone, yeah. is it? And, and it ties into the whole thing you've just been saying about Matt Letizia. My big thing with this is, we'd be much better, if you want to withdraw your consent from anything, stop buying any fucking public publications and stop reading any publications that trades in this shit. Mm. Because even this, it's as you said, it's grim. It's great that he's had the character to do it and and even to go to therapy in the first place. It's huge. Like I, I literally do this for a living now. And I, something I always say to people once they get reach out to get help is give yourself a lot of credit for that because most 100%. people are not doing it. Um, and I remember when I first had to reach out and get help and stuff and you look back to, to that time. And what, what, what would that have been now? Six years ago, something like that. And I remember going to 
the, th- the therapist on, it was in Old Hall Street at the time. And my whole business life was based around there. I lived just down the road. And I remember coming out of his office the first time, coming downstairs into the street and bumping into someone I knew from the business world. And my entire system was like, don't let him know where you've just been. Mm. Joe was like, oh, he'll know. He'll know. Like his fucking office was just one little office in this office block. And my brain's going, oh my God, this fella's going to know I've just been to see a therapist. But within weeks I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm going to start talking about this publicly mm. because it helps other people. But it, but it's an absolute disgrace that what's forced him to come and speak about this at this point is tabloids basically saying to him, well, we're going to run the story. Yeah, we know you were in there. And yeah. they'll think they're doing, doing a good thing there by giving him a chance to run the story first. Yeah. And you're like, you're not, you're not fellas. Well, we've had, you know, we, we, we've had a light shined on, on, you know, tabloid newspapers and the practices, obviously, you know, or like the phone tap and stuff and all that kind of stuff. But I, I still don't think that that side of journalism, it, 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 you know, more of a light needs to be shined on it. More, it needs to be talked about more because I mean, you know, I I didn't hit some mad heights or anything. We, you know, in, in my journalism career or anything like that, I don't claim to be an expert on it. But even sort of, you know, what the bits and bobs I've done and where I've worked, and I just heard some like grim things over the year where you just think, I don't know how you, I don't know how you treat it that way. Like I was never comfortable when I was a news reporter being told to go and knock on someone's door where someone had died. You know what I mean? I just thought, that's grim. Yeah. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not looking to ever be a news reporter again, so fuck it. A few times I didn't do it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I'd, I'd say I'd gone and I'd go to someone's for a brew and yeah. I just said they're not in. Yeah. Because I just thought like, I don't see what intruding on their grief does. Like, is it really that important to go and ask them what they think about their son being killed in a fucking car crash? Really? Why? It's not. Leave them alone. And like, you know, people who did do, there was other people that I met over the years as well who did do that stuff and did do that journalism. And their methods, I just thought were, like, I remember one, one fella telling me, he said, oh yeah, you know, when when it's a big story and a, and a big story around someone dying, and especially if it's like a kid, um, we, you know that it's going to be like the rate, the race to get to the door first mm-hmm. and like get in there with the family and all that. And he said, what I always do is um, I ask if they've got pictures of him or him or her. And I get all of them so that, you know, I, I say, oh, if you've got more, is there anything else you've got? And I said, I keep asking until you give me absolute loads of them and I'll take them away knowing that when the next paper comes knocking, there's it's no pictures on. for them. Fucking and you're like, oh, yeah. Grim. Yeah. Grim as fuck. But during that moment, that's where I like, and I, I, I'm better at this now, like in this phase of my life, of with that person, say in that environment, just connecting with that person and saying to them, just take a step back though and forget your job. And we, t- me and you have talked about this loads over the years and we the way people talk on social media. We mentioned it last week, social media comments. Just take a breath, take a step back and think about what you're actually doing here. Do you know what I mean? Because for that person who's doing that, they've convinced themselves in their mind that this is okay because this is what everyone does inside their mm. profession. But if you just bring them back to just being sound and say to them, do you think it's sound what you're doing though? I know. Would you like that if that was your mum? Would you like that if that was your brother or sister or would you like someone knock on your door and like strategically taking away all the pictures so that that's just And horrible. like essentially storing people as well and going yeah. through bins and you know what I mean? And all this like surveillance type stuff and all that, all for the chase of a, a story. I just find it like grim. It's just not, it's just, it's just not for me. Um, mm. The... What else was I going to say about this? I mean, from, from all of this as well, you know, from all of the conversations I've heard around this and, you know, various people were, were getting interviewed and, and, and doing media bits around it and all that. I mean, I heard Chris Kirkland on the radio uh, who himself had problems with, you know, sleeping pills and that kind of stuff. Um, and and he, he's taught, you know, we've done stuff with Chris and, and all the rest of it over the years. He was on The Wrap, um, did stuff with him um, with another podcast that I did for a while as well. Good lad, Chris, um, you know, and I, I really like him. But he, he always says about like that, he got good support from the PFA. But the thing that always sticks in my mind is he went, he had to go and ask for it, do you know what I mean? And I, and I think from what I've heard this week or this last week or so, it still seems like mental health is dealt with in a fairly slapdash manner mm. by football. It's not taken ser- seriously enough. And, it, you know, it, the PFA, okay, I've obviously got... I mean, from what I understand, if you go to the PFA, they just basically refer you to, you know, various counsellors um, that, you know, 
are on their list or whatever. Like it's not ingrained into what they're doing with footballers and how they're being managed, certainly at the top level. I mean, you no, know, I can understand if you're saying it's not, re- is that really like necessarily lower down the leads? Probably not because they're not getting the same attention. You know, this thing where they can't do anything and everything that they do do is commented on, you know, and some of the stuff that you'd had like with Raheem Sterling and things like that, where it was just like borderline racist shit from tabloids. And it's like, just, you know, they, they need they need to, like, be basically taught to have this huge mental backbone almost to cope with this shit. And I don't think there's enough of it there. I don't think, I think it needs to be more part of clubs and part of how they manage. You know, even when I've heard bits and bobs, like, you know, Steve Peters was fortunate enough to interview him once. And obviously he was in at Liverpool at one point. Hmm. But everything was, if you wanted to go and see him, you could. Yeah. No, you're having a session with Steve Peters. Yeah. Like, and, and, and to me, it should be, you are having a session with Steve Peters. Mate, I, I wrote something on it a few months ago when, when Liverpool's team was in a massive slump. And I, I was like, because I mean, this is an extreme end of it, right? But I've, I've always said this. So for everyone listening, like this applies to all of us, everybody in humanity, like we're all human. It's all on a scale. At, at some point on the scale, everyone listening to this, including me and you, are dealing with the shit that, that, that Deli Ali dealt with. And that was a big revelation for me when I was like learning about this one. I, you know, I, I basically broke down, I had depression, was suicidal. And when I went back and studied all this stuff, because I just immersed myself in it to change mm. my life, what I realised was we, everyone's really good at like associating the idea that severe trauma as a child, which is what Deli Ali experienced, leads to severe problems in later life. But a breakthrough and realisation I had during like learning was all this was. Yeah, but it's all trauma as a child has an impact later in life. And we all experience trauma as children because children experience the world differently to grown-ups. Mm. So there's loads in that. Um, but what? But the bit I, like when you roll it all the way up, I just, I can't believe, and I'm, I'm including the likes of Guardiola and Klopp in this. It would, you know, held aloft as the greatest football managers of their generation. This is my prediction. We will look back at football now in 10 years' time in the same way we look back at football before Wenger came to Britain and he changed nutrition. Like, do you when you think back, like when we were talking about the pie before and I mentioned steak, my brain went to me, now the steak one should be Keegan because have you ever seen that clip of Keegan where he's like, I needed to bulk up. So to bulk up to get in Liverpool's first team. His training regime was running up and down the steps of the stadium and eating steak every day. Yeah, That's it. So the greatest football minds of that generation, Bill Shankly, following in Bob Paisley, Joe Down the Road, all of Joe, Busby, the Busby yeah. Jock Steen, all these people, they didn't have a fucking clue about nutrition. None. Like their idea of good nutrition was have a steak, lad. That was it. Yeah. Fast forward a few years, Arsene Wenger comes in to Arsenal's dressing room and goes, sorry, you're all getting bladdered on a Saturday night after a match. That's going to stop. Yeah. You're all eating fish and chips. That's going to stop. Hulier, Pasta. Hulier the same at yeah. Liverpool. Fucking Joe Nutrition, nutritionist. Think about every Liverpool footballer, every Man City footballer has a personalised nutrition plan that matches their body composition identically. Mm. And as you said, right, this is the bit that I don't get. That is not optional. If you yeah. want to get paid 250 grand a week to play for Liverpool you Football Club, yeah. you will fucking eat this food and drink these drinks. And everyone goes, sound, why? Because we understand that our bodies react to it better. Yeah. But with the mental side of things and the emotional side of things, nah, fuck it, do whatever you want. I know. And you're like, what? It's mad. That's mad, it's isn't it? It's mental. It, it's absolutely mad. And like, you know, I remember Steve Peters saying, you know, like, I, I think The Chim Paradox is a, is a great book and, and I'd, I'd recommend that to anyone who's interested in all this kind of stuff and, and everyone should be interested. Um, but I remember him, I remember saying to him and I was being, a, what was I being a knob? Uh, maybe. I just sort of said to him, like, do you still get angry basically? You know, do, does your chimp still get out the box if you like? And he went, of course it does. Yeah, I'm a fucking human. And, and he said, he said, mental health should be treated like general health. You know, like, so like, if you want to get in shape, okay, well, you start going to the gym or you start running or you start walking or whatever, or, you know, you might take more care of your diet. 
it's ex- he said it's the, it should be treated exactly the same with your mental health. You've got to work on it. You've got to you, you've got to read about it. You've got to find something that suits you. You've got to find your coping mechanisms. You've got to you've got to basically start being sound with yourself and looking after yourself and that kind of stuff. And that's always stuck with me. That 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 proper resonated with me. That and like I still have dark times myself and like and then I'll think back to that and then I'll go well what am I doing right now that's good for me and what am I doing right now that's bad for me Mm. okay well I'll do more of that and less of that then do you know what I mean and and then you know fingers crossed that's that's generally sort of working for me even when I'm having some low times I'll go I need to exercise more here because that's good for me. Mm. I feel better Mm. after it mentally as well as physically Um, you know I need to start eating better you know, and things like that. And, you know, like anyone, I'll have my ups and downs and sometimes I'll be brilliant at sticking to something and sometimes I won't be and all that kind of stuff. But I always think of that advice and think that was really, that was spot on. Do you know what I mean? Have you got any, because I know you've read that, you've obviously written your own books, you've read everything, <laughs> uh, listened to a million and one podcasts, you've seen therapists, you've, you've spoke to coaches online and all that. Have you got any bits like that, that like, you know, like jump out to you as like, great advice for someone who's like wants to do something about the mental health my my biggest thing well it's funny isn't it like where, even in my own stuff so my book the book i wrote on this i was chat, i had a session with my my original coach the other day checking back in with him over something five years ago i started working with him we were laughing like it was nice to check back with him and um i was laughing with him because i i'll sometimes say to people i need to i haven't read my own book for a while and that sounds quite egotistical mm. right i'm reading my own book it sounds like the do you know the Brendan Rogers, who's your who's your best mentor? It was me. Yeah. But but the thing I always say to people is no, but what you've got to what you've got to understand about my book is that that is my that I wrote that for for me because that's a summary of everything I'd learned, yeah. all the stuff you your said, thousands of hours, yeah. people all around the world. I was like, this is what makes sense to me, and then I think if it makes sense to me this way it'll make sense to somebody else because I'll be saying yeah. it in a way that works. So Steve Peters rose to prominence because of his way of des- describing it to people, yeah. you've got a chimp in your head. That makes more sense to people. As soon as I hear people online, and, and I think it's with the best will in the world, this is the reason I wrote my book and started doing what I did. There's this book I read, and I remember sitting there, and there was a, a word with 12 syllables in it. So as I'm trying to read this book, and I'm a, you know, I'm a university-educated former lawyer who probably top, I don't know, 5%, in the population of education and stuff like that, maybe higher. I remember someone said to me once in school, in sixth form, like by doing an A-level in math, you're in the top 1% of mathematicians, which is mad, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But, um, and I'm sitting there reading this book like a fucking four-year-old, Joe, like spelling out the syllables. And whenever that happens to me, I'm like, you've lost people. I've, I've always yeah, said to people about to Donald simple. Trump with this, there's a test yeah. you can do, like what level are you speaking at? And loads of people who had Joe, like, highly felucid or whatever, like you know, highly educated will say people like Donald Trump are idiots and they can't understand why so many people like him. The reason so many people like him is people can understand what he's fucking saying because he will say, this storm is very wet. Every single person who hears him say that knows what he means. You mentioned before Russell Brand, who I really like. Russell Brand loses. Think about it as again, educate, all education levels very similar. You're a fucking yeah. journalist. And he says words that you don't know. Yeah. So as soon as he says a word you don't know, your brain goes, switch off. And the thing about the chimp paradox, and this is the way I like to talk about this stuff is, talking about it in language people understand. Yeah. Do you know what it means when I say there's a chimp in your head that goes fucking wild when something goes? And everyone goes, yeah. Yeah. Instead of going. So what happens is your prefrontal cortex, that starts talking to you, your amygdala. Everyone's like, oh, stop talking about science. No one's interested in that. It doesn't matter to anyone whether it's what the name of the part of your brain is. It's your chimp. And so I talk about, what I talk to everyone about is we're all flawed humans because that's the other side of it. Understanding that this happens to everybody. And just because you learn loads of stuff doesn't mean you stop getting angry. You just learn how to process things better. And that's where peace comes from. That's where this healing comes from. Be interesting. I haven't watched the full interview with Deli Ali, but it'd be interesting to hear him talk in detail about what happened to him in, re- in rehab. What did he learn? Because that's where people find value. Yeah. I mean, he talks about feelings he was holding on to and, and, and that he was 
dealing with it by himself. So he's obviously like opened up about this mm. this stuff for basically the first time. Even like the, you know the family that he's you know he's basically ad he's adopted as his own. Uh, they didn't know about about a lot of this. So you know he's not he's not talking to anyone about this. I, I think you know just on the talk and thing as well. This is another sort of like a bit of a bugbear for me around mental health. I see all the time all these campaigns that say talk, talk, talk. And I get it. Like, you know, don't, I, you know, talking to someone is better than talking to no one, I think, because 100% it, it does lift something from you to, to say out loud what you've been thinking or what you're saying about yourself or a problem that you've had all these years, whatever it might be. But I would say, having been through my own difficulties, and you, you need to speak to the right person. So just talking to anyone, I've tried, I've talked to, you know, long-term friends, I've talked to people of trust, whatever. Some people just don't know what to say and why would they? That they're not trained. They haven't, they haven't, you know, if you're saying to them like, I, listen, I've had really dark thoughts and like, you know, I feel worthless, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're throwing all that kind of stuff at them. What, what, what? No one's been trained in what to say in that situation. 100%. And, and, you know, you'll get some who will do the oh, you'll be all right, or just, you know, the pull yourself together type chats and that kind of thing. You are you are 100% better going to see someone who knows what they're on about. Yeah. You know, so I've been to see a therapist. I've done NHS stuff as well. Um, the, you know, the CB, what's it called? CBT. Yeah, I've done that. Um, and with, with varying degrees of success. There's probably li little bits of, everything including books I've read as well and all that, that that I'll still use and still refer back to even bits out your book I mean you know me and you have talked extensively about you know life problems issues how I feel all that kind of stuff and like you've referred me to things in your book and I've gone that is absolutely spot on for what I'm dealing with there that's that's bang on do you yeah. know what I mean well but this is the interesting thing Steve Peters do you know, come back to do you know what's it, my advice to people and or you know, suggestions I don't like giving advice and there's so much because as I said the book's 650 pages long for mm. a reason that's when people go to me can just sum it up I'm like it's 650 yeah, pages yeah, yeah. long for a reason um, but the thing Stephen Peters Steve Peters said to you is is the thing I always say to people and I, I couldn't agree more with what you've just said and I think it's a very tricky thing to say out loud I did a video and I remember when I started my YouTube, other YouTube channel it was during COVID and I did a video about depression video about suicide video about taking advice and it similar to what you just said. And I knew when I was doing it, it's a very dangerous topic to say because all it takes is one person to go, well, you told me not to speak to me, mum. And I'm yeah, like, no, no, no. And, and this is the thing, yeah. like, if you've got no one else to speak to and you desperately need to speak to someone, speak to someone. Yeah. And at the same time, if you can afford, you know, if, and this is my thing I always say to people, if, that, that a lad emailed me last week with this and it, and it was a really lovely email and I'm privileged to get emails like this from people. He said to me, he came to me about a year ago and, and he said, I can't afford to get help. And I said to him, if one of your children needed a life-saving surgery, would you find the money? Mm -hmm. Like if you needed a grand for yeah. that, would you find the money? And he went, yeah. And I went, why aren't you treating yourself with the same level of importance exactly. then? Yeah. And the, but the thing I always say to people is, it is crucial that you speak to someone who A, knows what they're talking about and is trained to deal with this stuff. And B, you have a rapport with. So the people who find, come are yeah, drawn to my coaching are people thing. who are like me. Yeah. So, and it, one of the reasons I started doing it was, I as I started sharing it with people, you could see people like the idea that just some normal lad is talking about this stuff. Yeah. So when they come and talk to me about it, and I'm like, the difference between me and even like lots of qualified therapists is, I've been there. I've done this. Like even it's public, so he's happy for me to talk about it now. There's an interview on my, on my YouTube channel, Steve Warnock, the yeah, Liverpool yeah, yeah. player. He said to me, like, the reason he really enjoyed doing the work with me was because he knew you. He knew me, and I, and I'd been through it. Yeah, it wasn't just me talking about it through a text. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but the important thing is, you find someone because I've spoken to Joe older people who some you know, someone's gone to me. Will you speak to my ex? Do you know, will you speak to my parent, my sibling? My, and as soon as I start speaking to them, thinking it won't, this won't work because we haven't got the rapport. Yeah. You, you, you know, if I'm talking to a 60 year old woman, she might like hear some of the stuff I'm saying, but she needs to speak to someone she clicks with. Yeah. Because 100%. that's how it works. Like yeah. the people who speak to me click with me. But the these conversations, or, oh, 
nearly, nearly lost the new glasses there. Uh, it's because you haven't got your glasses on to see your glasses. I know. Um, but, but these things should be normalised, shouldn't they? It shouldn't be seen as any kind of weakness that you're going... I, I still think like yeah. loads of, of the way we talk about things is wrong. You know, saying like, oh, midlife crisis... Oh. Well, well, that that that's not a thing. That's people suffering in one way or another with their mental health, or yeah. you know, facing challenges that they don't know where to turn, and so and, and maybe they turn the wrong way. Like, don't don't normalize like uh, like putting them down. Oh, you're just having a mid like no, no, I'm not. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah, where yeah. to turn. Everything's going wrong. That feels like my life's falling in on me. I don't know what to do now. You know, I I I think all of that. Even like you know, you both talked about therapy we both said just on the show today that we've both been you know normalize saying that normalize talking about that normalize just saying it's not it's not mad it's not it's not weird you know like i was like you you know like the first time i went and sat in the chair i felt like you know like like fucking hell it's like the sopranos this do you know what i mean you know and then within like five minutes of talking well it wasn't do you know what I mean? But think about it. The person we chose to speak to, and I purposely chose him for that, he was an older version of us. Yeah. He's an old scouse. He's an older scouse fella yeah, yeah, who's yeah. dead sound and he swears and he tells fucking stories. And I remember that. Like, I remember him saying to me once, Paul, you can be spiritual and healthy and swear. That's sound. And I was like, thank fuck for that. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I see all these other people online and it's all like praying hands emojis. Yeah. And I would say to people, if you want me to help you with your stuff, sound, but just so you know, there'll be no fucking praying hands emojis mm. and I'll call you out on your bullshit and I'll tell you to fuck off and you can tell me to fuck off and we'll sort it. Like, and that's, that's sound, not for everyone. It? Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. So, the, you know, the other, the, the soft stuff, if you like, you know, that might work with some people, that might work with their personalities. Mm. It's 100% about finding, you know, yes, talk to anyone is better than talk to no one. Don't lock her up. Don't don't sit there, you know, sort of beating yourself up and doing yourself down. Go and talk to someone who'll say to you, who might be able to say to you, well, well I look at your what you just told me and what about this and what about that and you've got that and you've got kids and you know, there's loads of aspects of your life that are great and there are people in much worse situations than you are you can pull yourself out you you might get that but you will 100% see the difference if you go to someone who knows what they're talking about and can tell you how you change that yeah because I think just releasing on someone who doesn't know what they're talking about you might get like you might feel a little better that you got it off your chest but you're, you're likely to return to the same place would, would, would be what I say from well, my experience. Yeah, I agree with that. And on top of that, I think the danger is, and I've seen this time and again in my own life and for other people, because most people are, don't know how to deal with it, you'll, you will likely talk to someone close to you emotionally. And what tends to happen when that happens is they take on your emotion. They don't know how to just hold space for you to feel and talk without them being involved. So then what happens, and I used to say this to certain people in my life, I won't name who they are, but I'd say, you know, the, the, the phrase, a problem shared is a problem halved. I used to say to them, that's not true. When I share a problem with you, it's a problem times by a hundred because you start making it your issue then. You start making a big deal of it. You start fucking worrying. Yeah. You start stressing. Guess what? Now I've got to worry about you. That doesn't help me. Whereas what I've realized over the years is paying someone, and this sounds like a mad thing. I remember having a moment where I, I felt quite sad because like, oh, the people I speak to the most about this stuff, I pay. And then I realized after reflecting after a while, it's better. Why? There's nothing expected in return. Mm. I don't have, when I speak to a therapist or a coach- And be brutally honest as be well. brutally honest. They're not judging me in any yeah. way. They're used to talking about this stuff. So you can mention anything. It's completely confidential. And guess what? They just la- they're just there to listen to you. Yeah. There's no like, okay, now do you feel, at the end of it, you don't have to go to them. And how are you feeling? Tell me about that. And then listen to their shit. It's just like, this is fucking magic. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. And last point on this for me is, um, and I still can't believe this, it goes back to the football thing and someone at some point, and I, I you know, this is something I'm trying to edge myself into because I think even from a sporting perspective, like Wenger, the first football team or the first sporting organisation that embraces this properly will become fucking unbelievable. Do you know when, when Klopp talks about mentality monsters, it will be way beyond that. It will be people just like, you, you can't beat us, you can't break us because we're so solid emotionally and, and psychologically. And that will then seep into, into society. But th- that won't come until that whole like joining the dots, until we stop separating talking about mental and physical health. Yeah. Like I can tell you, like there's literally a story about how that happened in Western medicine. Like there was a point a few hundred years ago where before that, 
we always considered mental and physical health to be part of the same thing because your head's connected to your fucking body. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, a, there's a doctor I've followed for years now who's in that, that world. And he's like, isn't it mad? Because he talks about healing illnesses through like what's going on inside your head. And he's like, and my whole concept is built on the crazy idea that your mind is connected to your body. And he laughs. And you're like, yeah, that's no, yeah. That's no you're fucking wild, is it? Going back to what we said before. If I was telling you that your mind is connected to my body, well, that's a bit of a fucking leap, isn't it? But if I go to you, no, your mind's connected to your body. So it's all linked it's together. All together, yeah. Why are we, why are we separating that still? It's, it's mad. mad. It's mad. It is mad. Uh, one other book I'd quickly recommend. I'm not going to tell you what, we're out of time basically, but The Midnight Library uh, is just another book that I think is fantastic and worth a read uh, and might make you think a little bit differently when you get to the end. Uh, okay, well, that's been a heavy subject to get stuck into. We've done our best in the time we had. Uh, hope you uh, liked the chat. Uh, do as ever, give us your feedback, comment on all the socials, uh, send us an email, fill out the little form on our on our website, do whatever you want. We read it. We read read everything we check all our social media we read all the emails that come through uh, sorry if we don't always reply but sometimes we do get a little flurry and it's it's just difficult to keep up uh, we hope you've enjoyed uh, today's show uh, we hope you're enjoying the podcast in general uh, and if you'd like more as we mentioned there is the patreon uh, for a pound a week you can get an extra show every week uh, there are 11 shows on there now as well if you want to dig into the archive loads of them are, are fairly timeless they're on quite big topics some of them and some of them are just absolutely mad and we're just talking about life conspiracy theories all kinds of stuff on there so check that out as well uh, thanks very much that has been the late challenge number 24